the blind will see. In Jeremiah 5.21, it says, Hear this now, O foolish people, without understanding, who have eyes and see not, and who have ears and hear not. In Matthew 13, 14, it says, And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. In Matthew 13, 16, 17, Jesus says, But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For surely I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. In the Old Testament, it was a reprimand from God that the people of Israel had foolishness, that they, they had eyes to see, but they could not see. They had ears to hear, but they could not hear. And they lived life. They, they, you know, the people of Israel, the Jews in the Old Testament, they were the people of God. They still are the people of God. But they were the people of God. They had the, the written word of God. They had the testimony of God. They had the testimony of Moses and the prophets. But yet, time and time again, Israel would slay their prophets. Israel would, would put down the preachers. And Israel would, would turn against God. And though they claimed to see, though they claimed to know the way, they were blind. They were blind. They were blind. They were deaf to the truths of God, to the love of Christ, to the love of the things of God. But in the New Testament, Jesus is speaking in Matthew 13, and he says to these believers, he says, you're blessed because you see, because you hear. He says there were many righteous men and women who in the past, in times past, desired to hear and see what you now hear and see. You're blessed. You're blessed. You're blessed. And that is us, the church today. We should hear. We should see. We should know. It's by faith that we live. My people shall live by faith. And this is the problem, though, that we have in the church today. I believe that there are many, many Christians in the church today that must become blind all over again so they can see the Lord. I believe that there are many preachers in the pulpit that need to become blind. They need to be stricken by the, by the, by the fear of God once again so that they may hear and know the things in God and lead the people into, the, into rivers of, of eternity and life. I believe that with all my heart. Now, in Acts chapter 9, verse 1 through 19, I want to take you there. There was a man by the name of Saul who would later become Paul. Now, many of you in the church know this story, but there's a twist on this story this morning. And I want us to look at this for just a moment. Saul was a man who was once persecuting Christians. He thought he knew the way of God. He was raised up in the temple. He was raised up with the Pharisees. The greatest of the Pharisees, uh, Gamaliel, had, he was a, a teacher of Saul. And even Gamaliel had the wisdom one day to, to say, let's leave these men of God alone, Peter and John. So Saul came under a great teacher of Israel. But yet, even then, Saul was a persecutor of Christians. Saul was a persecutor of the truth of God, even though he claimed to belong to the truth. Guys, is there anybody like that today in the church? We claim to belong to the truth. We claim to love the truth. But yet, by our own foolishness, we, we could possibly, some of us could be living a life that's dishonoring to God and can lead others astray. Look, every child of God is a building block or a stumbling block. We need to choose who we are today in Christ for his glory. Acts 9.1 says this, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way of the church, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. 
Here was a man who thought he knew God, but he knew nothing of the resurrected Savior. And I believe that all of us at one point or another in our life, we're on a road, a road that does not lead to the things of God, but praise God, this was a road that led straight to the throne of God. What the devil can do for evil, God will turn around for his glory. There are some that may be watching online right now, watching this video at a later time, some that might be in the sanctuary. You're on a road, and you know you're on a road that you should not be on today. Sometimes God's people get all messed up all over again. And if that's you, I want to talk to you this morning. If that's not you, you can go ahead and go on back. The turkey's hot and ready to eat. Amen. You see, I could only imagine what Paul was going through, who would later become Paul, what he was going through in those three days. I mean, I don't know about you, but for me, not eating, not eating or drinking anything for three days, that says that there was a little something on your mind. There was a supernatural experience that had just occurred to Saul. And many of us need that road to Damascus conversion once again. Many of us need that encounter with the God of heaven and earth. We, we, we become desensitized. I, I'm not speaking especially of the church in America. We become so desensitized by the sin all around us. It, it can, it's going to happen. We're so used to seeing the evil in the world today. We're so used to seeing the immorality that's in the TV commercials, that's at our jobs, that's in our families, that, that's in the car right next to us. We're so used to seeing all of these things that sometimes when it happens, it just doesn't bother us anymore. And when that happens, we stop praying about it. We stop believing in the things of God, that God can change the situation around, that God can save the lost, that God could heal the, the lame and, and cure the blind. There are so many people that are sick and need Jesus today. And we can come and play church until Jesus comes. Some of us will get caught up. Some of us may get left behind. I don't know. But I believe that we're living in the greatest time, not to build the church, but to bring in the harvest. And yeah, you could say, well, that's building in the church. There are a lot of preachers out there that just want to fill the seats. And their hearts are still empty. There's no hope. There's no love of Christ. And this is what has to change. And let it begin in your heart, in my heart first. If we want revival? Let it begin in your own personal life first. That is where revival begins. It begins in the prayer room. It begins on your knees. It begins at the feet of Jesus. It begins when you're willing to sell everything you have and just lay it all at the feet of Jesus Christ. Your jobs, your spouses, no one is going to save you. Only your relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you sold out for him? He was sold out for you. Paul was on his knees. And there was a man down the road named Ananias. Verse 10. It says, There was a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street, street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen the man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name for before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Do you see how Ananias is having a conversation with the Lord and it's casual? To me, he has talked to the Lord before. He wasn't like, oh my goodness, Lord, I can hear your voice. Oh no, is this the Lord? And just shrink in fear and just, oh. It was common for Ananias. He knew the voice of the Lord and he had mostly many times spoken to the Lord about things before. This man was in prayer. And that's why I say, you want revival? You want to see the things of God? It's going to begin in prayer. It's going to begin in prayer in your home. It's going to begin in prayer with the church. That is why so many churches, so many Christians do not have the prayer life that they ought to have. Because that is where you see the beginning of the miracles of God. What churches have prayer meetings today? 
What churches just simply come together and say, let's pray about this. Let's believe in God for this. According to his written word. We become so desensitized by the busyness of life that we think that this is not offensive to God. Our lack of prayer life, our lack of Christian fellowship, our lack of being in the word. We think it's not offensive to God and it's very offensive to God. You got to remember, the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But God says that heaven and earth shall pass away because they gave in to the devil, but my word shall remain forever. And Jesus says, let the word remain in you and you remain in me and I in you and we will remain in the Father. Ananias says in verse 17, he went his way, he entered the house and he laid hands on him and he said, brother Saul. See, he knew now he is a brother. He's a Christian. He already knew. Nobody but the Lord told Ananias what was going on in that room before he ever went into that house. He said, brother Saul, he said, the Lord Jesus, not another priest, not another preacher, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that is what we need, church. Paul needed it. You need it. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. What does that look like? Speaking in tongues? What does that look like? Prophesying? Here's what it looks like. Love, joy, peace, peace patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I've been raised up in many different kinds of churches, and that's why we are a gospel-believing church. I've seen people speak in tongues and go out there and, and sleep with their neighbor. It's not about all of that show and glitter. It's about living a surrendered life, dying to yourself to be alive to Christ. It's about being transformed from the inside out. Paul needed the Holy Spirit to, to go from being a murderer to be willing to be killed for the name of Jesus. You get what I'm saying? And that only comes through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Where the Spirit of God has marked you for the day of redemption. And if you don't know what that is, here's the first thing. Start asking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You, start asking for it until you get it. And I promise you, you'll know it. You'll know it. That is the evidence that you've been baptized in the Spirit of God, that the fruit of the Holy Spirit begins to be produced in your life. Yes, there are the gifts. The gifts have a purpose. All the gifts are there still. But the fruit of the Spirit, it begins with love and it ends with self-control. There is forgiveness this morning in the name of Jesus. If the Lord is convicting your heart, I want you to be of good courage this morning. The Lord loves you and he wants to redeem you because you are his. Verse 18, immediately, not two hours later, not 30 minutes later, immediately, immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and received his sight and he arose and he was baptized. Hallelujah. So when he had received food, he was strengthened and Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. He was brought into the family of God. He was strengthened. Look, he, he, for three days, did not eat, did not drink. He was hungry. He was thirsty. But the things of God came first. Today, people work, people work, people work, and then they put God to the end. Paul had the total opposite mindset. I don't need physical need. I need this encounter with Christ again. And so much of the church today will put Jesus on the back burner of life. Jesus was on the front burner of Paul's life now. And he displayed it by saying, I have no physical need to be met right now. I have a spiritual need. Though he could not see, he knew that that was not his problem. That physical blindness was not his problem. It was needing to be touched by the love of Christ. That is what he needed. That's what he knew. And there is so much today in the church. They need to put their physical needs on the back burner. They need to take it off of the burner, period. Amen. Amen. And they need to say, Jesus Christ, you are the only thing for me. Judges 13, 3 through 5. 
And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Judges 13.7 and he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. Now drink no wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Let me tell you something. When God calls you, he calls you to life. He calls you for life. He does not call you for a season. I've seen so many people come into ministry. Oh, and then they walk out two years later. Oh, well, I, I have a, I'm entering into a new season. And it's just ridiculous. God calls you for life. God calls you. He's called you. He's anointed you. He gave you those talents. The call of God is what? Irrevocable. What is the call God has put on your life? God, as he saw Samson from the womb, amen? As he saw Samson from the womb, look, he sees you from the womb. He sees you from the womb, amen? Amen. Amen. Now, Judges 16, 28 through 30. I want to tell you about Samson. Samson was a, a man who was called from God to do great work for God, for the nation of Israel. And what does a Nazarite mean? It means that you're to never cut your hair, you're never to drink, you are dedicated to God. And look, Christian, let me just put this. All of you, are called to be Nazarites. A Nazarite is someone who is dedicated to God, period. Their whole life. God will bless you. God will fill you. God will anoint you. God will give you everything. But just like Samson, he was not to drink the things of the, the, the world, the, the alcohol and all of that. Somebody could say, well, a Christian, should they drink today? Now look, let's go deeper. I think that is so generic. I think that is so ridiculous that Christians today are even debating whether we should drink wine or beer. Seriously, if you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll, a whole new realm of life will open up to you. I'm just telling you that right now. Oh, is it okay for Christians to get tattoos? Now, you know, you're worried about the marking of your body. What about the marking of your heart? Let's go, let the Holy Spirit go f deep into you and you'll know what the things of God are and what, the, what are not the things of God. Let the Lord give you discernment on that. But we know the story of Samson. He loved women. He was strong. Killed the lion. Killed the Philistines with a jawbone of a donkey. Killed a thousand men. Wow. With a jawbone of a donkey. Killed a thousand men. What else did he do? What else did he do? Did so many great things for God. God anointed him. God. But, but Samson had a weakness. And let me tell you something. If you have a weakness, the devil can expose that. You know, the devil, he knows your strengths and he knows your weaknesses. And so does God. And whatever, whoever you surrender your strengths and your weaknesses to will be your master. Will be your master. Let that sink in real hard. We know what happens with the story of Samson. His wife, Delilah, she finds out, please tell me what is the, 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 the secret of your strength. And he told her. And they cut his hair while he was asleep. And then what happened? And then what goes on? He's put in jail by the Philistines. What else happens? His eyes are gouged out. He loses his eyesight. Like who? Like Paul. Like Paul. His eyes are gouged out. You see, Paul was in a bad place in his life. He was a God hater, though he thought he loved God. And Samson was going that way too. He began to forget the things of God and not cherish the things of God. He knew that his connection to God, it was in that vow of a Nazarite from birth. 
And you, Christian, you have that vow of the Nazarite. You've made that promise to Jesus. The Bible says, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. You either serve him or you don't. Jesus says in the book of Revelation, Jesus says, because you're neither hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, Jesus says, I will spit you out of my mouth. I will spit you out of my mouth. And there are a lot of people that claim to know Jesus, but they're lukewarm. And what does that mean? That means Jesus will reject them. You see, this is the part of Jesus that a lot of the church in America doesn't want to hear. They don't want to hear that kind of Jesus. But this is the Jesus at the end of the Bible who says, I will reject you. I will spit you out of my mouth. Why can't we talk about that Jesus? We only talk about the Jesus who loves you, but we don't want to talk about the Jesus who is the judge. The Jesus who, who where one day they will all stand before his, his, his throne and they will be judged. The books will be opened and whosoever's name was not found written in the Lamb's book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. Well, they'll be burning and weeping and they'll be weeping and mourning and burning forever and ever and ever. There will be no end to this. See, a lot of the people don't want to talk about that today, do they? We are one breath from the reality of being in His presence for eternity or departed from His presence for eternity. We're one breath away. It's that fast. It's that quick. No matter how young, how old you are. You're a Nazarite, Christian. We are living in the end of the church age where we can witness the greatest harvest the church has ever seen. But Jesus knew this, that in the latter days, he would say, the harvest is ripe, but the workers are few. They're asleep. They're, they're, they're slumber. They don't want to get off their couch. The workers are few in the church. And therefore the harvest suffers. Many will not. That's why the Bible says, beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel. Whether you're welcoming somebody at the front door, teaching children in the back, singing up here, preaching, whatever it may be, coming and cleaning the church, going out there and, and going door to door and, and, and talk to people and pray with people. There are so many things that a church can do in its community. The Lord put on our hearts years ago, eight years ago, to start a Christian school. And now, if the Lord tarries, we'll be able to hire some other people to begin to, to operate that. Hannah and I have been a part of that from the beginning to lay the foundation of that. But it's time for others to get involved. But the workers are few. So many are busy with building their own kingdoms and not the kingdom of God. You think I wanted to start a school? You think I wanted to do that? God is doing what he has to do to reach out to those lost children out there, to those lost families. God is doing what he has to do to come into the living room. As Satan comes in through the TV, God will come in through prayer, through fellowship, through the invite of the Christian. But the workers are few. Samson was forgetting the work that he was called to do, so he had his hair cut off. He got his eyes gouged out. God disciplines those he loves. If God has to gouge your eyes out so that you can see his plan, he'll do it. Because you know why? Because this world fails to compare with eternity. You can live your life on this world as a cripple, maimed in a wheelchair. It's just for a moment. It's just for a moment. But what is eternity? What is eternity? Eternity is forever and ever. And this is what you're working for. You're not working for your salvation, but you're working for the glory of God. In Judges 16, 16 through 17, Samson came to his realization and he said, okay. And he says, and it came to pass when that she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him. So that his soul was vexed to death that he told her all his heart. And he said to her, no razor has ever come upon my head. For I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. And if I am shaven, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Samson knew the plan of God. Christian, you ought to know the plan of God. Samson knew the plan of God 
and yet he dishonored the plan of God. He, he allowed the enemy to come into the garden. And that is what is happening today in the churches. We are allowed the enemy to come in. In Judges 16, 28 through 30, he's a prisoner. His eyes are gouged out. He's about, he, the, 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 the Philistines are all together. The Philistines are all excited that they've captured this great warrior who had tortured them for many years. It says, Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me. I pray, he says, Judges 16, 28. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the middle, two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself again. Then, one on his right and on the other his left. And then Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might, and the temple fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. Now, we're talking about death here. But today we're talking about, we're talking about saving life. Look, if you will be willing to put your life down for Jesus Christ, people will be saved. Do you hear me? Because you're denying your time to the world. You know, the Bible says that if you, look, 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 hear this out. The Bible says that if you will lose your life for his sake, you'll find it. But if you keep your life, you'll actually lose it. You heard, you've heard that before? In order to follow Jesus, in order to fulfill the plan of God of salvation, you must die to yourself. And Samson came to the point where he understood this again. I need to die. And I'm willing to die. At the time, it was taking the life of the enemies of God. But now, it's getting, saving the lives so that they become the people of God. And if God needs to make you blind and crippled in this day, he'll do it. Hebrews 12, 5 through 6 says this, And you have forgotten the exhortation which becomes to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Amen? Now let me just give you this one more in Luke 19, 1 through 10. It says, Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. It says, Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but he could not because of the crowd, for he was a short stature. So he ran ahead, and he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste, and he came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, this Jesus has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This being a tax collector in that day was being... At the bottom of the totem pole, the bottom scum bucket. I mean, it was bad. You're taxing your own people working for the Roman government. You get what I'm saying? The Roman government would tell Zacchaeus, you need to tax people that walk through this road every day. We want $1,000 a month, and whatever you make on top of that is yours. You know Zacchaeus is going to be charging everybody outrageous prices so that he can make a profit for himself after paying off the Romans. That was a sorry job to have. And yet... Jesus looked at him and said, I must stay at your house tonight. Jesus doesn't care what kind of person you are, but he does want to change you. Because look, from this man accepting Jesus into his home in the very next verse, it doesn't say that they sat down, that they ate, that they talked, nothing. It's once Jesus says, I must come to your house, the very next verse, when they, they, after they all complained, it said Zacchaeus stood up because hours had passed. And he says, I want to make everything right. 
I was a cheater, but now I'm going to give back the money to the people I stole from. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do what is right. I'm going to give. I'm going to give to those who are poor. I'm going to. There's a change in his life. Why? Because Zacchaeus, his master at the time, was greed, was the love of money, was the spirit of mammon. And that may not be something that you were bound by. It may be a spirit of lust. It may be a spirit of, of, of different types of perversion. A lying, a gambler, a drunkard. What You know, all of us at one point or another, before we knew Jesus, were one of those things. We're just a denier. We were a God-hater. We were an atheist in heart. We were just lost, whatever it may be. But it must be surrendered to Jesus. You see, G this man Zacchaeus, he didn't need to be blind. He, was, he had already been blind. This man Zacchaeus, he was ready to see. And though nobody would fellowship with him and talk to him because tax collectors were hated people. But Jesus loved him. And Jesus came to him. And so, but here, here's what I want to tell you, church. If Jesus is still going to them today, why aren't you? Because if you claim to follow Jesus, then aren't you over there where Jesus is, where the sinners are? Not going to the bars and hanging out at night with the bar in the bars. I'm not talking about that. But I'm saying asking the Lord in the morning, Lord, use me to win a soul. A divine appointment. Lead me, Lord, as I'm in the grocery store, as I'm at the red light, whatever. Give me the word, give me the action to lead someone to Christ. And all you have to do is step out your front door. And you're in that world. You don't have to go to the bar. You don't have to go to the club. You don't have to do anything like that. Once you step out your front door, you're there. You're there. You're there. And God will use you. Because if you claim to be a Christian, when is the last time you led somebody to the cross? If you claim to be a Christian, you should be able to see the things that God sees. If you claim to be a Christian, you should be able to hear the things that God hears. The book of Revelation, those let the Spirit let the church hear what the Spirit says to the church. Revelation 2 and 3. What is the Spirit of God telling you today? What is the Spirit of God putting on your heart today? Here's the key. Romans 12, 1 through 2. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You know what this is right here? This is Paul right here in this verse. Verse 1. This is Paul giving the vow of a Nazarite. Because that is what a Nazarite did. They were dedicated from birth, their body, their everything. They were set apart for the work of God, the Nazarite. And this is what Paul is saying. Offer your body a living sacrifice. See, that is why it's called reborn again. Because when you become a Christian, you're reborn again as a Nazarite. You're reborn again dedicated to the work of God. If we claim to follow Jesus, we must be involved in the work of Jesus. Verse 2, And here is the click, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Too many churches today try and advance the gospel, so-called gospel, with tactics of the world. And that's not of God. That's not of God. Let the Lord conform you, fill you, lead you. What you did before the cross must come to an end. You must be transformed. It doesn't matter that your family abandoned you. It doesn't matter that you failed your family in times past. It doesn't matter what happened in the past. Today is a new day. And you need to make it right for the next generation to come. In my last verse, 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16, here's what Peter says. He says, Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. And rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What does it mean? To gird up the loins of your mind and be sober. Well, it doesn't mean don't drink beer. Let me tell you what it means. It means be sober. What it means? It means be filled with the Spirit of God. You cannot be filled with the Spirit of God and the Spirit of the world at the same time. It's not going to happen. If you're filled with the Spirit of God, you'll be empty of the things of this world. Be sober. Be serious. There's life and death before us, man. There are people dying every day. The atrocities that we have, have heard that have been happening 
upon years and thousands of years in this world by war, by famine, by epidemic, and it's all happening again. As I come to a close, the church is entering into its final moment. We are coming down to the church age. There is an evil that has come from the pits of hell that this world has never seen before, and it's now being manifested in this world. Now we know that in times past, in wars, we've seen atrocities, we've seen such evil. But what we have witnessed the past several weeks that came out of Gaza has an evil that is mind-blowing. Now we're all of age here. But I'm going to speak what is about to be said. But when these IDF soldiers of Israel come in and they find that babies were put in the ovens to be roasted, and when they find that women were, had their heads cut off and their legs spread open, they had been raped and tortured in the most brutal, brutal way, videotaped it. This is an evil that is, that, that, that is about to grow like a fungus. Because we see anti-Semitism in this world growing and growing and growing. And it's not at the doorstep, it's here. It's in your living room. It's all over the world. And like I said last Sunday, as the Israel goes, the church goes. Because we're not separated from Israel. God is once again going to deal with the nation of Israel. And he's dealing with it now. The Lord may tarry another 20 years, but the Lord may come in about 10 minutes. I have no idea. But I think we need to be serious. I think we need to be serious about the things of God and who we claim to be. As the body of Christ, as the church of Christ, as the bride of Christ, we need to be faithful to our husband, Jesus Christ. I think that we need to be sold out for him. L look at this, 1 Peter 1.14. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. You know what holy means? It means to be separated for the things of God. God is separated from evil. He is holy. He is separate. And you must be holy. You must separate yourself from the things that are unholy in this world. Verse 16. Because it is written, God says, Be holy, for I am holy. I'm not concerned about filling the pews. I'm concerned about filling the hearts and that could only come through the gospel message of Jesus Christ. The blind will see. It's time to serve the Lord. It's time to stop making excuses. This may be your last opportunity before the coming of the Lord. This may be your last time. If you call yourself a Christian, then let's lead them to the cross. American Christianity is being exposed for what it is. It's false. It's just coming and do your service, your, your Sunday thing, your, your, your doing a little giving here, a little bit. It's so much deeper than that. that. Following Jesus is so much deeper than that. It's so much deeper. This church other Bible-believing churches are hanging on by a, by a prayer. They're hanging on by the thread of prayer. And that's all that's holding them. It's time to rise up, army of God, in the name of Jesus.